My name is Babak Idraki. I'm a gynecological oncologist. That means that I take care of women who have gynecological cancers. A big part of what I do is surgery. When the organizers asked me to give this presentation, they asked how my being a Baha'i impacts what I do. And then they said, you have 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> I can do it in 10 seconds. It's all about intention. There you have it. All about intention. Intention is defined as an aim that guides action, a purpose. Holy words and pure and goodly deeds ascend unto the heaven of celestial glory. Strive that your deeds may be cleansed from the dust of self and hypocrisy and find favor in the court of glory. This is a quotation from Baha'u'llah, who's the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. Looking at this quote, you realize that there are two requirements. The first one is purity, meaning purity of intention, where selflessness and nobility of thought add to the purity. Here, the value to the intended recipient is the primary goal. Now, in contradistinction, things that reduce the purity of an action are greed and self-promotion. In this situation, the value is to the self. The second requirement from that quotation is the action which follows the intention. As a matter of fact, purity of intention requires maximal effort to do the job right. You can't say that you have an intention to do something good and then put only half your heart in it. That would be hypocritical. You must be all in, 100% vested in the outcome of the action that you're doing, 100% effort, do your best. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I do. A good proportion of what I do is taking care of women who have ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is a horrible, horrible disease. About 22,000 women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer in the United States on a yearly basis. It's the second most common gynecological cancer, but it accounts for the great majority of the deaths in our field. The reason for this is that when ovarian cancer develops, the cancer cells slough off of the ovary and they spread throughout the abdominal cavity and they go and implant themselves on different organs in the, all the nooks and crannies of the abdomen, among the bowels, all the other places, and then they start to grow. The symptoms aren't obvious at first. They're subtle. A little indigestion, a little fatigue, a little bloating, generally mild abdominal discomfort. Please don't think that all of you have ovarian cancer right now, because I know that that's going through your, your mind right now. So when the patient and her doctor finally find out that there's something wrong, the cancer has usually spread far and wide. As a matter of fact, about 70% of the patients who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer are diagnosed at stage three and four. Very advanced, that's part of the problem that we have. The treatment is difficult, it's tough, it involves surgery, it involves chemotherapy, and despite it, still more than 75% of the patients recur. Ovarian cancer is one of the few cancers where in advanced disease, complete surgical removal of all of the cancer is a good prognostic indicator for the patients. This is called a debulking surgery. If we can achieve a complete debulking, meaning that we remove all of the visible cancer at the time of surgery, then the patients have a better oncological outcome. They have better response to chemotherapy, they have better cure rates, better survival rates, and if not a cure, then longer disease-free interval meaning that it takes longer for the cancer to come back, therefore giving the patients a longer time to spend with their family and loved ones. Please understand that a complete debulking does not mean a guarantee of cure or uh, long-term survival. 
but it gives the patients that option, whereas without it, that option is very, very unlikely. It's not going to happen. As of 2017, a complete debulking is the number one predictor of survival in patients with ovarian cancer. As surgeries go, ovarian cancer debulkings are big surgeries. And it's hard, not only for the patient who has to endure this big surgery and oftentimes ends up in the ICU a few days after surgery and then has to recover and then get chemotherapy, but also for the surgeon who has to have the skills and the patience and the fortitude to stand there and go through the whole abdomen and remove every single bit of disease. In the United States, only about 40% of the patients have a complete debulking. Many factors account for this relatively low number. The extent of the disease, the patient's underlying health, the availability or unavailability of subspecialized care, but also intention. When I operate on patients, my intention is to heal and to do my best. That's why sometimes the surgeries take as long as eight hours or more. This is just one example. This intention to heal and to do the best that I can for my patients permeates through everything that I do for them. When intention is not pure, then patient interest is no longer the primary objective. And if we believe Baha'u'llah, that purity of intention impacts the action, then the quality of the deed can be compromised. Unfortunately, we live in a society that rewards ego and greed, self-promotion, consumerism. The complexities of modern life make it very difficult for us to know the intention of the people that we interact with. I see too often in medicine, as well as in other things, the negative impact of our society when people do what they do just because they have to. It's just a job. They go through the motions, they collect a paycheck, they're not very vested in the outcome. They don't want necessarily excellence. This is what I call the it's a good enough syndrome. In preparing this presentation, I tried to see if there is any way to tell other people's intentions. I came across education, professionalism, experience, and a lot of other laudable qualities. All of these are important, but they are not. They are not surrogates for intention. As a matter of fact, they're subservient to it. If you have a pure motive, then you want to learn about what it is that you're doing, so that then you can do it better. You want to go get experience from people who've done it a lot, so that you can gain from their experience, and then you, keep, you want to keep doing it yourself so that you gain your own experience. You build on your own experience. And you behave professionally. I'm a surgeon. I'm not a philosopher. In my humble, uneducated opinion, the purity of intention comes from within. And it has to do with the love that an individual feels for his or her fellow human being and for society. It requires self-awareness. It's a process. This is not a scientific talk. I don't have data to show you. I can't prove to you scientifically the importance of pure intention and its link to the quality of the action that results from it. But I'm telling you it's true. <laughs> My intention my own intention for giving this talk tonight is not to tell you about ovarian cancer or about surgery or about medicine, but it's to be a positive agent for social and spiritual transformation. I invite you to ask yourselves the hard questions. Why am I doing this? What is the benefit to others, to society, to myself? Are these benefits aligned? How can I align them? Is what I'm doing right? Is it noble? If so, am I giving my 100% to the task? 
how can I do it better? This is an exercise that we can all do. I hope asking these questions brings awareness and a sense of purpose to our actions. Thank you.